Okay, great. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, maybe I'll just start off with some very general remarks. Um, I'm sure all of you are aware that quantum yang nils theory is a you know, famous problem in dimension four, and you can make progress on that and prove a mass gap. You can claim your million dollars from the Clay Institute. And naturally, if you go down in dimension, things get uh, more manageable. In three dimensions, it's actually still wide open uh, what to do. And uh, well, in two dimensions, a lot is known, uh, but not everything. And so I'll be uh, that's why I have a talk to give on two-dimensional Yang Mills. Um, you know, my, my own entry into this, this subject was, you know, um, the realization that, you know, uh, quantum field theory is, you know, uh, sort of one of the pillars of mathematical physics, trying to make sense of that. And, and somehow, you know, it's, 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 uh, there, there, do, there don't seem to be enough uh, mathematicians, uh, uh, you know, the number of mathematicians working on, on, on making sense of quantum field theory is comparatively small. And so um, th that's what drew me to the subject. And, um, and I think you know, I, I found some questions that have been overlooked in the uh, math and physics community. And, and uh, the kind of math that I've been using to answer those questions are actually uh, are very broad. So, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today, some, some of these problems and, and the uh, broad amount of mathematics that I've had to use to address them. OK, so let me first begin by giving a very uh, quick overview of uh, classical to quantum, since I'll be talking about quantum Yang Mills theory. So, in classical physics, one has a space of fields, and for gauge theories, one has uh, a connection denoted by A. That's your basic field. Okay? And also in classical physics, one has an action functional, say the Yang Mills functional. Okay? And, well, classical physics studies the order of Lagrange equations uh, for that functional. Okay? So, that's sort of a uh, very succinct summary of classical physics. What happens when we go to quantum physics? Well, so if we're going to do Euclidean quantum field theory, uh, what we do instead of um, sort of making precise measurements, what we have to do is now take an expectation. So in quantum physics, uh, things are statistical. And so one has a partition function in which one uh, integrates you know, this is uh, formal for the time being, but uh, we'll, we'll get more precise later. One integrates over the space of all fields, and one weights it by e to the minus action over uh, a constant, uh, Planck's constant. It's sort of the quantum parameter. And uh, classical physics is the limit as h bar goes to 0. Okay? So when h bar goes to 0, that exponential gets localized onto the, uh, the minima of the action. And so that's how you get the old Lagrange equations. Okay? And uh, so that's the partition function. And then the quantities of interest are uh, expectation values of observables. And so that's an expectation of the observable O against this, uh, this uh, putative measure. Okay. Well, so as I said, this was all formal. And the problem is that the measure dA is uh, usually a guiding fiction uh, rather than a well-defined mathematical object. Okay. Um, well, nevertheless, that hasn't stopped people from working with patent integrals. And uh, in quantum gauge theory, there's been lots of seminal work, say, in churn simons theory and uh, supersymmetric yang mills theory. Um, for low-dimensional topologists, that's, uh, you know, that's um, the famous work of Witten in, in, in deriving uh, three-manifold invariants and Donaldson and uh, Cyberg-Witten invariants. Okay. All right. So um, just to also, uh, as a warm-up, let me sort of maybe uh, describe a little bit about some of the issues with path integrals, just uh, so we're familiar with that. Um, in 0 plus 1 dimensions, one can make sense of path integrals. That's uh, the famous uh, Wiener measure. But let's maybe take a, a closer look at that. Uh, so if one wants to, say, make sense, well, one can make sense of the integral on the right-hand side. Okay, So you have uh, a free particle. And that's the kinetic energy of a free particle traveling from x to x prime. Uh, in time, from time 0 to time t. And uh, well, uh, the sort of the transition probability of Brownian motion is what you get from doing that integral. And that's exactly the, uh, the density of the heat kernel that you see on the left-hand side. Okay? And so that's how you can make sense of that path integral. Uh, and I chose exa this example because one can sort of see some of the, the features that are problematic. Uh, if we look at the notation on the right-hand side, this d gamma doesn't really exist. There isn't any infinite dimensional Lebesgue measure. Okay. Also, a uh, curious feature is that the integrand, this e to the minus action, also doesn't exist on the support of Wiener measure. Wiener measure lives on the space of continuous functions. And so uh, you know, the, 
the, the, the norm squared of the gradient uh, won't be finite okay, for such functions. Okay? But somehow, uh, this combination does make sense. Okay? So you could think of this as somehow infinity times 0. Right? The Lebesgue measure is somehow this you know, very large thing. And then this Wiener measure should be e to the minus infinity on continuous paths. But somehow, that combination actually does give you something that's well defined. So when you say the Wiener measure doesn't exist, what, what exactly is the problem? And how that problem is resolved when you combine two ingredients? Uh, okay, so, so this combination is, is, is sort of, I'm just being heuristic, you're not really combining them. I mean, the, the, okay. the, 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 only the combination makes sense. Uh, okay. Yes? I think for physicists, what we're saying means is that you can only integrate a certain class of functions. So if you claim that Lebesgue measure of gamma existed, you'd be making ridiculous claims about what can be integrated. As a physicist, you would say you can only integrate the exponential reaction times reasonable things. And that, I would interpret that as the content. Um, um, okay, I, 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 yeah, I guess we can, we can talk more about that. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I think, actually, well, we could talk about this, you know, maybe more in detail after my talk, but if you discretize things, you can kind of see clearly sort of, you know, you can take a, a, cont a continuum limit of a discretization. This is probably what you've seen in textbooks, and then this all kind of becomes more but straightforward. This but is only claim to the exponential minus the action times a certain class of good functions. They don't claim to integrate everything. Uh, if well, you can integrate everything, you're not finishing the little bit of integration. Well, 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 I don't know why. I, th I, th I thought, well, the point is also, I mean, you know, you want to integrate, say, over the space of continuous functions, and, and while well, e to the minus action doesn't make sense over that, so I'm not, I'm not sure your claim really addresses that. But, and, but okay, but this is, this is all sort of heuristical stuff, and I don't, okay. All right. Uh, okay, and well, naturally, things get harder as we go higher up in dimension. Okay. Okay. Uh, Oh, I thought I moved this slide to another one. Okay. Uh, weird. Okay. Um, okay. Well, uh, we can start with this slide. I thought I updated my thing. Okay. Anyways, so um, what are we going to do um, uh, since we um, uh, have this uh, perturb conventional? Oh, sorry. S since we can't make sense of um, path integrals in general. What do we? What 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 is the conventional approach? Well, it's to do perturbation theory, okay, and it's formal perturbation theory, okay, and that's how most quantum field theories are sort of uh, approached. Uh, um, that's the only approach we have for, for in many cases. Um, so we have uh, just to illustrate this methodology for those of you who might not be familiar with that. Um, let's look at this one-dimensional example. Okay, so this uh, integral of e to the minus x squared minus lambda x to the fourth. Well, what you can always do, okay, is you just, um, you know, s separate the Gaussian part and then you uh, Taylor expand the the remaining part, and then you sort of, you know, you do an illegal uh, change of operation where you move the sum outside the integral, and then you get a formal series in lambda. Okay, and this, uh, well, you can always do this uh, irrespective of the convergence properties of that integral. Okay, and the resulting series is purely formal. And you can already deduce that because the left-hand side is only well-defined for lambda non-negative. And this is going to imply that the radius of convergence of the series is 0. Okay? And it's even more than just that. Right? I could have replaced x to the fourth with x cubed. And then the integral uh, will, only, will only converge for lambda equals 0. But I still get a well-defined power series. Okay? Um, the reason why we might want to do this construction is that in favorable cases, it is known that the series that you get is actually an asymptotic series uh, for the underlying integral regarded as a function of lambda. Okay. So, so sort of the logic is uh, because of this fact in finite dimensions, the hope is that, um, or the, uh, the, the default assumption is that by doing perturbation theory for these uh, ill-defined integrals, we hope that that series might be some kind of asymptotic series for the uh, path integral. Okay. So, the um, yeah. Okay. So then, the fundamental question then is, um, well, if we have an exact construction of a path integral, okay, and we always have this perturbative construction, right? Is it true, just like in the finite dimensional example, that when I set lambda to zero, that the perturbative series is, say, an asymptotic series of the exact answer? Okay. And you see, that's 
But the thing is that that's actually a rare, very rare situation <laughs> because only in very few examples do we have an exact construction. So um, for example, we have scalar field theories in dimension two, so that's P phi two, polynomial interactions. Um, I'm not so sure about the theory in dimension three, but I believe there's, you know, there's some, uh, some also, uh, if you have renormalizable scalar field theories in dimension three, you can construct those, okay? Um, uh, not, dimension four is you know, uh, very, very hard, um, but sort of the, the case that I'm interested in is 2D Yang Mills uh, because it's, um, to my knowledge, the only pure gauge theory that has a rigorous construction in the sense of having a measure and being able to compute expectation values Exactly. Okay. So let me just recap. For most quantum field theories, right, sort of the default thing to do is to do what's on the right-hand side, that formal expansion. And we don't have a left-hand side. Okay. And sort of the conventional approach is just to treat that as, as you know, your, basically your definition of the path integral. But for 2D emails, we actually have an exact construction. So this question makes sense. And um, this really hasn't been properly addressed in, in the uh, math and physics community. And so this is the question that, uh, is, is that I'm looking at right now. Okay? So look, I'm, not, I'm now going to tell you about Yang-Mills theory and the exact construction of the measure. And then I will tell you about my results in, in, in answering this question. OK. So for 2D Yang-Mills, what's your uh, basic field? Your basic field is a uh, g value 1 form, a connection. Okay, so I'm just <laughs> going to say work on R2 for the time being. Okay, so that's the gauge potential. Then you have the curvature, which is given by that expression. Okay. And the Yang-Mills functional is just the L2 norm of the curvature. And in two dimensions, uh, what you need to specify, in addition to your underlying two-dimensional space, sigma, is the Hodge star operator, which uh, in two dimensions only depends on an area form. So you if you have an area form, you divide. You take your two form, you divide by that area form, you get a function, and then you can pair that with your curvature, and you get a top form. You can integrate that. So that's the Yang-Mills action. OK, and now I need to tell you what the observables are. Okay, so my question involves computations of things. And so I need to tell you what I'm computing. And the natural class of observables in gauge theories are Wilson loops. Okay, so to specify a Wilson loop, I need to give you a closed uh, loop. I also need to give you a class function on the gauge group G. That is a conjugation invariant function, say trace in, in an irreducible representation. And so what I do is, um, well, now it's a functional on the space of uh, connections. Okay? And I feed in a connection. Uh, what do I do? I, do? I compute the holonomy of that connection around the loop. It gives me an element of g. And then I feed in g into f. And that gives me a well-defined gauge invariant function on the space of connections. Okay? So these are a rich set of observables because they, uh, the class of them uh, form a dense set in, this, in the space of uh, gauge invariant continuous functions. And that's because connections are basically specified by holonomies around uh, arbitrary loops. And so the thing we're interested in computing is the expectation value of these observables. Okay, so if I have this uh, Yang-Mills measure, which I will explain in a moment, then I can compute its expectation. Okay, okay so how are we going to do that? Um, sort of the most straightforward way of defining this measure will be to uh, put the theory on, on the lattice and then take a continuum limit. And uh, the formulation I'm about to describe to you is first due to Migdal, and then it was um, uh, refined by uh, Witten. Um, so what do we do? Uh, we start with the triangulation of our surface uh, equipped with an area form. Okay. So, um, so a triangulation is something with uh, vertices, edges, and and faces, and uh, what I what do I do? I put uh, edge, uh, I put group variables on each edge. Okay. So now, so now I've um, in the continuum theory, my va basic variables are elements in the gauge group. Okay. And I have one for, uh, for each edge. Uh, I can orient the edges arbitrarily. Okay. In this case, I oriented these edges in this counterclockwise fashion, and to each face, I can. Uh, uh, look at its boundary, which will give me the edges in, in, in some uh, order. And then I can define g of boundary of f to be the multiplication of these uh, uh, group valued elements in that order. Okay. So in, in this way, uh, I have a rule so that uh, after each face, I get a group valued element. Okay. And what do I do? I'm going to feed that element into 
uh, a heat kernel okay, uh, at some time. Um, well, OK. Uh, the, the time is going to be a coupling constant uh, times the area of the face, the area with respect to this area form that I've uh, chosen. And uh, the heat kernel is just the convolution kernel of the heat, the heat operator on the group G. Okay, so the group G has uh, an add invariant metric, a by invariant metric. And so that defines a, a Laplace Beltrami operator. You look at the heat uh, semigroup that that generates. And well, then you get this density. And dH is, is, is Haar measure. Okay? So you have this operator. You have this convolution kernel. And that defines for you a function uh, on the group. And to each face, you feed in this group valued element. And you weight the time by, uh, by the, the area. OK. Uh, can I ask? Yes. The purpose. Uh, yeah, why, why are you yeah I, I'll explain it a minute. This looks. I was going to say this looks very ad hoc uh, right now. And why is this discretized Yang Mills? I don't know. If that's your question, but I uh, I was going to. Oh, well, I'm trying to define a discretized version of Yang Mills. So right now, I'm just telling you the prescription for how to define. I'm, I'm building up the ingredients for defining the Yang Mills action on I this. Think you're for example, show that this function has especially simple properties. Right, yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. I mean, are you saying why, why am I doing this instead of, say, the Wilson action? Is that maybe, is that no, in I particular? I don't know what the heat kernel has to do with anything you have been discussing so far. Oh, yeah, this is, this, right now it's a little bit unmotivated, but. I was just applying character to the bucket variables. This is a particular character. This is a sum overall. Of yes, but which I'll show in a second. Yeah, sorry. Just if you just maybe be a little patient, and, and, and uh, I, I make it. This is the this is what this came out of the blue. Okay, uh, literally, it's blue. Okay, so um, okay, so so I wanted to find a measure on the space of my fields. Okay, so my space of fields is uh, a copy of G for every uh, edge variable I have. So I have a measure that defines on my that. So gamma is my lattice. E is the set of edges. I have a measure now uh, on the well. Okay, which I. With, you know, that depends on this lattice and the area form, which I write as a coupling constant times some fixed reference area form. Okay, so what is it? It's the product of hard measures for each group variable, indexed by the edges. Okay, and it's weighted. It's weighted by a heat kernel. Uh, what, what is lambda naught is, is going to be my, is a coupling constant. Yeah. So really, the area form I just sort of split it into two pieces: a fixed one and then. Just this lambda not just so just so the coupling constant is visible is manifest in the theory. I mean the theory really depends on this combination, but I just or the lambda not because I want I want to see a coupling constant. That's all. Okay, just by analogy with my onsets before. Okay, so really I have an area form and a graph, and my uh, measure is going to be uh, the product of hard measures and then this heat kernel for every face. Okay. So the, the, the subscript there refers to time. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the time is weighted by the area. Okay, all right. So, so, so this is how I define my discretized Yang-Mills measure. Okay. Uh, now let me explain why this uh, this is a, a sensible thing to, to look at. So, um, well, first of all, for small time, right? So for small faces, because I'm going to take a continuum limit, so all my faces are getting smaller and smaller. For small time, then uh, well, my group valued element, uh, which I can, if it's close to the identity, I can write as e to the uh, x, where x lives in the Lie algebra, then the heat kernel uh, looks like a Gaussian for small times. Okay, there's some constant here, which I can just pull out. But it looks like e to the minus x squared divided by 2t. Okay? And well, the way I define g partial f, that's going to be infinitesimal holonomy when the face is small. So when, 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 when the time is small, the face is small, then x squared is the curvature squared. And that uh, formally is Yang-Mills. Okay. So I don't know if that makes you happier, uh, sure, but, um, but that's, that's one way you can see why this is a sensible thing. Um, there's a better reason why it's sensible, and I'll get to that in a second. But at least at, this, at a heuristic level, this, this looks sensible. And uh, OK, so now that, well, now that I've heard at least one motivation for this measure, now we can define uh, the, partition, the lattice partition function, which is the integral of this measure against uh, all the uh, uh, over my space of fields. And then the expectation is now just um, expectation of f, my class function. So I feed in a Wilson loop. okay, And g gamma is just uh, 
well, you, you, you adapt gamma to the, to the lattice, and then g gamma is just multiply all the group variables in the order uh, defined by that curve. Okay, so it's sort of the obvious thing that you should do. Right? It's the holonomy along the lattice. You feed that into your function, you take its expectation. So this is the discretized version of Yang-Mills theory. Okay. Okay. So here's the real reason why this, the, you know, you really want to use this. this in any dimension, right? So far. So far, you can do this in any dimension. Yeah. Actually, yes. There's nothing. I. There's nothing special about two dimensions right now. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, but here's what's special about two dimensions. Okay. What's special about two dimensions is that this, uh, you, your. Um, you have invariance under subdivision. Okay? And it's actually a, a very uh, easy property to see. Um, right? So we have this convolution identity, okay? uh, which is just writing that uh, as a convolution instead of this uh, you know, tautological uh, operator equation, right? the, the heat equation. Uh, this, is, this is just the heat semigroup. Okay? Pictorially, what does that mean? That means that if I have this face here, and I have uh, you know, some product of edges that are g1, some product of edges that are g2, and I add an edge g, so I subdivide. Well, when I integrate out that, uh, that field, right, I'm just doing this convolution, and I get back the heat kernel on my, on my graph without that edge. So that tells me that when I subdivide, if I just do it step by step, then I don't change my, my answer, because I just, I just integrate it out, and I get, I get back the, the measure on this space space before I subdivide it. Okay. So, th so this is really the sort of the underlying, you know, reason why this, this is a really, uh, uh, you know, advantageous uh, uh, construction. Okay. Here you're saying you use two dimensions, right? Oh, yeah. Two, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Two dimensions is crucial because uh, in two dimensions, you know, edges have a, you know, you know, th faces have an outside and an inside. An edge has a left and a right. In three dimensions, uh, you, you, right, an edge meets more than one plaquette. You'd have top, down, left, right. And then now you'd have four heat kernels, and then you're, you're stuck. So uh, you can still define the action, but you wouldn't have invariance under subdivision. Okay, so two dimensions is, is, is crucial here, or sp special. OK, OK, okay so, so um, it's, it, and it's because of this a key property that, in some sense, the lattice formulation is already the continuum theory, okay? Because um, it didn't, it doesn't, the answer doesn't change as you subdivide, okay? Um, nevertheless, let me just talk about the continuum limit and and also write down some explicit formulas. Um, you know, depending on, you know, how rigorous you want to be, um, sort of a nice treatment for the continuum limit is due to uh, Thierry Levy, who, in his thesis, uh, sort of worked out all the probability theory. Blah blah blah. Um, sort of, you know, you want to you want to understand the question. As I take a continuum limit, what what is what, on what space does this measure live? On what space are my holonomy variables well defined? So you have to sort of understand some of the measure theoretic notions. And if you want to do that more carefully, you can look at his work. But I, I won't go into too much detail about that because that, that won't really be necessary. But you can make sense of the continuum limit really in a in a measure theoretic sense. Okay. But sort of for, on a more uh, informal level. Okay. Um, well, you can take the continuum limit because let's say I want to uh, compute the partition function on S2. Well, all I have to do is say divide S2 into two disks. I know my answer doesn't depend on, doesn't change if I keep subdividing it further, so I can already stop at writing S2 as the union of two disks. When I do that, then I just have to do this integral to get the exact partition function in the continuum theory. And uh, well, if you do that, then you'll just um, get the heat kernel. Uh, weighted by the area of the sphere, evaluated at one. Okay, so it turns out that uh, well, the, the heat kernel uh, doesn't. You know, inversion is an isometry on the on the gauge group, so I could replace g by g inverse, and then when I convolve, g hits the g inverse, and I get one. Okay, so you just do this integral, and it just becomes the heat kernel at the identity uh, at time equal to the area of S two. Okay, so that's the partition function. Okay, and you can also do this for higher genus and get a, uh, you know. Relatively nice answer. Okay, so this is the exact answer in the continuum theory. Okay, all right. Um, and for gamma piecewise embedded, say it defines a graph, and I can also define, say, the um, exact expectation value in the continuum theory. Okay, so j uh, just to test our understanding, the expectation value of this Wilson loop um, in this in this uh, 
if this is my graph on S2, then I would have two edges coming from these two uh, parts of the graph. And I would have three faces. So this d mu uh, would, I'm basically, I'm, I'm basically using my Wilson loop as a graph on my, on my S2. OK, so, so, so uh, I, I have uh, uh, this measure, which, has, uh, which, which lives on G, two copies of G. Okay? It has three heat kernels, one coming from R1, R2, R3. Okay, so there's two copies of G, three heat kernels. And then, uh, say, F is trace of you know, G1 times G2, if I, if I label this as G1 and G2. Okay? And then the heat kernel, will, there will be a heat kernel that has G1, a heat kernel that has G2, and then a heat kernel that has you know, G1, uh, G2. Okay, so that's, I've sort of hidden that from the notation, but that's, that's how this works. Okay. So it's, it's, it's very intuitive. You just draw a picture, you just insert things where they go, and, and then you, now you have a finite dimensional integral that gives you the exact expectation value of Wilson loop. Okay. And again, it's because of the invariance under subdivision that this is uh, the, the formula you get in the continuum theory. Okay. Without even having to worry about all the measure theoretic issues, wherever that measure lives, you already know it has to equal this thing from coming from the lattice. OK, so, so this is very nice. This is what makes 2D angles uh, tractable. And, and can you, does, does this stuff break down if you add matter fields? Or? Um, I haven't thought about it, but certainly you'd have to, well, um, I, um, uh, well, I guess if you discretize things with the matter field, I'm not sure you're still going to get invariance under subdivision, but OK. Yeah, that's so, the yeah, so OK. But, but right now, I'm just sticking with pure, pure Yang mills. OK. OK. <coughs> OK, so now let me re restate the fundamental question I asked earlier for 2D Yang mills. So let's first define uh, the dimensionless coupling constant. That's what you always want to be your expansion parameter. So um, in 2D Yang mills, sort of the, right, I, I sort of artificially split the Hodge star and the lambda naught just so I had a coupling constant. So Hodge star is 1 over area. So it's really lambda naught times 1 over area that's the invariant coupling constant. So if sigma is compact, I can let lambda be that. If, say, sigma is R2, then I just, you know, I can, you know, this would be, say, 1 if, um, if R2 is the um, standard, is equipped with the standard area form. I'm just being pedantic here just to put some area here. Uh, basically, lambda is lambda naught for, for R2 and the standard area form. But in any case, we have a dimensionless coupling constant, OK? And, um, OK, so the construction I just explained to you okay, is a function of lambda naught, okay, because lambda naught appears in the heat kernel. Okay, and so it, it's, it's, it's a well-defined function of lambda naught. Okay. On the other hand, the perturbative construction of these Wilson uh, loops, okay, using you know, sort of the standard uh, perturbative techniques well known to physicists, produce a formal series in lambda. Okay. And so the fundamental question is, I have this function of lambda, the exact Wilson loop expectation. When I send lambda to 0, do I, uh, are the asymptotics of that function captured by the perturbative uh, construction of this expectation value? Okay. And I say it's fundamental because sort of this is what you expect to be the case for all the other quantum field theories where you don't have the left-hand side. So this is really the, this is uh, addressing sort of the fundamental tenets of, of the quantum field theory. Okay, and this is exactly analogous to what I wrote down earlier in finite dimensions. Uh, there should be a sigma there, but okay, uh, right? You, so this is sort of the exact. And this is the perturbative, right? and you you hope that the, the asymptotics of the exact are captured by the perturbative. Okay. So now I'm going to explain uh, sort of the work that I've done in, in in addressing this question. Okay. OK, so let me first describe for you uh, what the perturbative expansion is. Okay, So recall that the perturbative expansion is a sum over Feynman integrals. Okay, Feynman integrals are obtained by generalizing uh, uh, what's called Wick's theorem, uh, th which is a finite dimensional result that tells you how to uh, integrate polynomials against Gaussian measures. Okay, So this is a, 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 a multidimensional version of this you know, integrating uh, a Gaussian against you know, x to the fourth. And now you have a general polynomial, and you have a combinatorial rule that tells you how to evaluate that. Okay, so you, so you, you here now A is a matrix, a non-degenerate matrix, and you plug in A inverse, which is has the indices upstairs, and you do all possible contractions. Okay, that's the sum over the symmetric group here, all possible insertions, and then you have a symmetry factor. Okay. 
All right, so that's, that's, this is all, um, okay, this is inequality, okay? Um, well, in infinite dimensions, to make, uh, the way this generalizes is that, well, now you have a kinetic operator. So this matrix is a differential operator. So that's right. the normalization part that was left. Yeah, that's why I put this little, uh, <laughs> yeah, OK, yeah, yeah, OK, yeah, OK. So up to a normalization, yes, OK. So this AIJ is a differential operator, OK? Uh, right, you have, you have a kinetic term. This, the inverse uh, is no longer an inverse matrix. It's a pair matrix, OK? It's a Green's function. It's the propagator. And uh, summation is now integration, OK? So that's how you generalize this to infinite dimensions. And of course, the problem is that uh, that expression usually isn't well defined because the product of distributions, a pair matrix will be a distribution, is no longer a distribution. And so when you try to integrate, you have the famous divergences coming in from quantum field theory. And so you need to regularize, renormalize. And also, in, in the case of gauge theories, you also need to choose a gauge fixing procedure. OK? All right. So gauge fixing. So you're going to do formal perturbation theory, uh, not using the, the fact that you can reduce it to a finite dimension. Right, exactly. This is formal textbook perturbation theory that they teach you. And they don't ask you many questions if this they, makes any sense. Check it exactly. 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 Yeah. OK. So gauge fixing, right? For Yang Mills, right, we have a kinetic term and higher order terms. So this is the, you know, this is the differential operator I was speaking about. Okay. Well, the kinetic operator has an infinite dimensional kernel because of the gauge symmetry. Right? So th this is the action of the gauge group and infinitesimally, uh, this looks like that, where x lives in the Lie algebra. And so when I do perturbation theory around a equals zero, then this image of D lies in the kernel of this operator. Right? And so we need to eliminate that gauge redundancy. Okay, what are we doing? Geometrically, it means we choose a slice that's transverse to the gauge orbits. And analytically, it means we're imposing extra conditions so that we get elliptic equations. Because elliptic equations are things we can invert up to some finite dimensional uh, space. Okay. Okay, so let me now um, sort of draw, I'm going to sort of keep returning to this nexus of arrows, okay? There's, there's lots of different gauge fixing conditions you can do in general, okay? And um, so let me sort of explain this, and then uh, the rest of my talk will be sort of uh, elaborating on what all these things mean, okay? So I'm going to be working on uh, basically S2, which also kind of covers R2 if you decompactify, right? So S2 has the round area form, and if you let the area of the sphere go to infinity, you're going to recover R2 with its standard area form. Okay, and um, okay, so that's a way you can unify uh, these two cases, and the the three kind of gauges I'll be talking about are, are these ones. Well, there's there's axial gauge and there's Coulomb uh, Landau gauge. Okay, um, those are basically the two gauges. Uh, axial gauge requires one to make sense of because it's singular, and you need to you know regularize it uh, essentially, and so um, uh, these are the two regularizations I'll be talking about in, in a minute. Uh, and these are, these are uh, well, my names for them. These aren't, uh, as far as I can tell, these aren't standard names. And um, so, so with axial gauge, I can um, use some stochastic analysis. And so I call it stochastic axial gauge. And I can also regularize it in the so-called uh, Wu-Mandelstam-Lebrand prescription, uh, well-known to f uh, physicists. And uh, well, in, 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 in uh, uh, Minkowski signature, you get light co a kind of light cone gauge. Uh, I'm doing a Euclidean version, so that I call it holomorphic gauge. Okay. So anyway, so we have these three gauges, and I'm going to explain now uh, kind of uh, how these relate to the fundamental question I wrote earlier. Okay, so let me now elaborate. Let me, I'm going to start off with the Coulomb uh, gauge, sort of the most natural gauge, so sort of ge geometrically. Okay. What is Coulomb gauge? On R2, you uh, impose this condition. Okay. You are killing the uh, longitudinal modes of the gauge field, Okay. and uh, you can and when you do that, then you, uh, say, have this as your propagator, this, the so-called Landau propagator, where you uh, project out the longitudinal modes. Okay? So this is inverse of Laplacian minus the longitudinal modes. Okay? So it's a standard uh, gauge condition. Okay? And um, if you're on a surface, what you need to do is you need to pick a metric. Okay? And with that metric, you can now define uh, d star, which is the formula, well, which is the adjoint of, of d. Okay? And that's sort of the covariant way of writing uh, this expression. Uh, okay. So that's, that's Coulomb gauge. You're restricting to this, this slice, this, this subspace defined by this condition. OK, so sort of, uh, well, 
the first result on the way to addressing all these issues uh, that I have is the following. Okay? So the first thing you want to do is, first of all, just to show that your results don't depend on your choice of metric. I had to, you know, I have to pick a metric to define this Coulomb gauge. Okay? So, uh, so this paper from uh, uh, last summer, um, I sh showed the following. So on S2, um, if I take my Wilson loop expectations with respect to this, uh, uh, with this choice of Coulomb gauge, okay, using the uh, Feynman rules that I generate from this, okay, um, if I regularize appropriately, there will be divergences. And then uh, it turns out, uh, as I let the cutoff, the, the regularization go to zero, I actually don't need any counterterms, so the theory is finite. And also, this expectation value is independent of the choice of metric. Okay. So this is just sort of on the way to addressing the fundamental question. I just want to make sure that when I choose this gauge, I, it didn't depend on how I, I chose the, the metric. But well, you mentioned several gauges, so you, you check them all. And well, I, I'm going to address. Yeah, I'm addressing. I'm going to. I'm going to go through these gauges one by one. So let me start with this. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, what about the other ones too. Okay. So for, for this Coulomb gauge, there's a family of Coulomb gauges, is what I'm saying. And, and, and I want to show independence of which, which point I choose in that family. Okay. Uh, how does the proof go? Well, intuitively, physicists uh, know this in their, in their path integral language. This is sort of a result of uh, what's called BRSD gauge fixing. When you vary the metric, you vary the path integral by a BRSD variation. And the integral of a BRSD exact, BRST exact term is 0. Okay. And so to do the BRST uh, theory, you need to add all these extra fields. You have a, a ghost, an anti-ghost, and, and this uh, nakanishi lautrup field. Okay? And, and they all fit into this nice package. And when you vary the metric, you vary by that uh, you know, BRST data, and you get 0. Okay? So this, this is uh, kind of the heuristic physics way of doing it. And you can read about this more in, in, in textbooks. Okay? It's a bit, bit hokey for mathematicians, but OK. Um, uh, sort of. If you don't like odd fields, then uh, sort of a bosonic version of this is, is sort of there's a fide of Popoff gauge fixing proce procedure where um, when you want to do an integral that has a symmetry, so for example, say in, if you're trying to integrate a function that's s1 invariant over r2, then when you um, uh, want to you know write rewrite this as an integral over the space of, of gauge orbits, so r2 mod s1 is r plus. Right? Then you, you have to pick up a weight, because right? you're, you're integrating over all these circles, and each circle has a different weight. So you have, you know, right? so if you want to write this integral over R2 as an integral over the positive x-axis, you, you can't just drop that 2 pi r, because you need to weight all these circles by their, by their volume. Okay? And you see, if you pick a different slice, right, you're going to get different weights, because the Jacobian factor depends on the angle between your slice and the gauge the gauge group. Okay? So when, when things are perpendicular, you just have the honest volume. When things are not so perpendicular, you pick up a, a different Jacobian. And what you're doing essentially when you vary the metric is checking that all these things change in a, in a coherent way so that your answer doesn't depend on your, your choice of slice, your choice of metric. Okay? To make this all precise, um, I used uh, the BV formalism as uh, made precise by Kevin Costello. Okay? So let me just sketch that a little bit. Okay? So in this formalism, you have a, a BV complex, you know, a space with all these auxiliary fields. So you have the space of one form, which is the space of connections. And then you have uh, so-called ghost anti-fields and anti-ghost. And these terms are sort of the kinetic operators appearing in your theory. This was the one that was the Yang-Mills kinetic term. These are, this is the one coming from the infinitesimal of action of the gauge group. And you know, this is the adjoint of that, just to close it up into a complex. Okay. And uh, so this is. These all, all linear algebra. I mean, they, these are all the uh, the algebra. Yeah, yeah. So, oops, oops. That should be a script G, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah that okay. that should be a script. I forgot a forgot a backslash there. Okay. So yeah, these are all Lie algebra valued forms on the manifold. Okay. Okay. So this is this is completely intrinsic to the theory. Okay, I haven't made any choices yet. Okay. What's a gauge fixing operator in this sort of algebraic setup? It's it's a it's a map that goes the other way. And the image of this map is going to give you sort of a restricted space of fields, uh, a Lagrangian or more generally isotropic subspace on which I'm going to sort of, you know, formally integrate over. So here, this is my, for example, this is my Coulomb gauge fixing condition. Right? I project onto image of D and take the Hodge star. So I restrict to image of D star. Uh, and uh, if I'm on S2, that's exactly the kernel of D star. Okay? This, that's actually what makes S2 nice. There aren't any zero modes okay, in this space. And uh, these are, these are uh, you know, other operators that I need to 
to make everything a, sort of a complex in the other direction. Okay? Um, and analytically, I need these operators because then what I get is an elliptic operator when I do the usual Hodge theoretic thing. I have a d that goes that way, a sort of d adjoint that goes that way, and then I compose the operators in, in the opposite order, and I get a Laplace type operator, which is what I get when I do that for this case. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I can't explain you know, all the details, but this is sort of what, what the, the, the formal structure looks like. I have this BV, intrinsic BV complex. I have this adjoint operator. This allows me to obtain my elliptic operator. Okay? And now I'm going to generate Feynman diagrams from you know, using this uh, elliptic operator. I need to regulate it somehow. Okay? Right? The Laplacian is going to be singular along the diagonal. And I can use a heat kernel regulator. So if, uh, if I want to write that in a coordinate invariant way, I can write it like this well, using, using the heat kernel. So I have a, a small time cutoff. Okay? So, so, so if, if I put 0 here, formally this, this Laplacian is Sorry, for, if I put a zero here, then if, if you look at eigenspace by eigenspace, it's formally the inverse of the Laplacian, because I just invert that on each eigenspace. This epsilon is, is, a, is a, a short distance cutoff, because if you look locally, it's what, happen, it's what is happening. And then the singularity, which is log of a distance inverse, becomes log of the maximum of epsilon to the minus 1 half, or the distance inverse. So, so you, have a log, you, you, know, you have a logarithmic singularity, right? but then you just sort of um, Cut it off at epsilon to the minus a half. So you just you just tamed it by chopping it off. Right? So epsilon is your regularizing parameter, parameter, okay? And it's to the one half because there's a quadratic relationship between time and, and space. Okay? But anyways, you you're 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 regulating the, the, the short distance singularity. Okay. And from there you can generate Feynman diagrams, okay, because the propagator is in this algebraic setup is this uh, it's basically d inverse on the image of d star. And if you write that in, in, Hodge theoretic, in a Hodge theoretic way, it's, this is how you do it. Okay. And um, OK, so, so what's significant is that, OK, so you're generating Feynman diagrams from this guy, and you regulate the Laplacian. Okay. And um, you know, I, I'm now sort of just listing these algebraic properties, uh, 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 you know, sort of the algebraic way, way of viewing all these things. Um, because the propagator satisfies this identity, you know, Q propagator plus pro propagator Q is identity minus projection onto the zero modes, one could say that that's a chain homotopy between the identity and pr projection. OK, that, that's some fancy topological language. But sort of the significance of that is that because of this identity, right, the right-hand side actually doesn't depend on the metric. My zero modes on S2 only come from the constant functions and the, you know, the you know, uh, volume forms that integrate to zero. Right? So, so, so the, the, the harmonic forms on the two-sphere are just you know, there's no there's no first Betty number. There's just a zeroth and a second one. Okay, that's that's what this is taking care of. When I vary the metric, the right hand side doesn't change, and so um, I should I should have put a p there, actually. Yeah, that should be a p. Okay, and um, what this is saying is that when I vary the metric, this propagator changes by something in the image of q because the q cohomology is zero, and so what this is saying is that the metric variations of the propagator are sort of gauge directions. Okay, that's sort of what all this algebra is, is, is capturing. And once you have that, sort of you can um, um, use the machinery uh, in, in, in Kevin's book to sort of um, prove gauge invariance. Okay. So, so that's, uh, this was maybe a very rapid overview of that, but, but that's kind of, I've tried to you know, sketch some of the, the details of that. Okay. So this is, this is sort of BRST exact in, in, a, in, a, in this more formal language. Okay. okay. So, anyways, so so using that setup, okay, just treat it as a black box. I can prove metric independence of this Coulomb uh, gauge fixing condition for Wilson loop expectation values. Okay, so now I'm going to start uh, mapping out the rest of this uh, diagram. Okay, so the next one I want to talk about is now this stochastic axial gauge. What is that? Okay, so let me tell you about axial gauge. Okay, so on R2, right, we have a connection, and these are the two components in the x0 and x1 directions. Axial gauge means I kill one of the directions, which I always can do. Right? I solve an ODE in the x1 direction that kills that guy. And I have some leftover freedom in the x0 direction uh, along, the, uh, along the x0 axis. And I can also kill that by using a, a, you know, a time-independent gauge transformation. Okay? So I can always use a gauge that lands me in this space. And that's axial gauge. Okay? What's nice about axial gauge is that 
Yang Mills becomes free in this gauge. Right? So all the quadratic terms vanish. There's no longer any bracket terms when this, when this is gone. And so my theory is just purely kinetic. Okay? So physically, that's why the theory is, 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 is soluble. Okay? And moreover, the curvature and the connection become equivalent variables. Okay? If I give you my connection, I know what the curvature is. I just take d1 of a0. On the other hand, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, if I give you the curvature, I know what a0 is. I just integrate along the y-direction. And because of this boundary condition, I, I can recover a0 from f. Okay? So this means that the Yang Mills measure, so this is, this is sort of an, uh, 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 a direct continuum construction of the Yang Mills measure without going to the continuum limit of the lattice. This means uh, that I actually can write down the, Yang, the gauge fixed Yang Mills measure in terms of what's called white noise, to probabilist. Okay? So the gauge fixed A, as I just explained, is equivalent to the curvature. And because it's a linear change of variables, there's no, there's no Fede of Popoff factor. I can rewrite this integral over A as an integral over F, where I think of F as the independent variable. And if you're a probabilist, then you recognize this as basically white noise. But basically, you have a Gaussian for each point on your space time. Okay? So if this were a one-dimensional integral, if F were x, this would just be a Gaussian integral, dx e to the minus you know, x squared. But now F is a two-form or a function that has independent values at every point in space. So this is a Gaussian at every point in space. That's what white noise is. Okay? More formally, white noise is a mapping, okay, which takes L2 functions to get, uh, Lie algebra valued Gaussian random variables, centered Gaussian random variables. Okay? So this is a normal distribution with uh, variance the L2 norm. Okay? And formally, th this is what you do. You just take, you take uh, your, your test function f and you smear it against this, this, uh, this distributional you know, guy f. Okay? And then when you take the L2 norm of, when you take the expectation squared, well, the expectation of, you're going to have two copies of this, and then you get a delta function, and then uh, that's how you get the f squared. Okay? So that's, that's a more formal way of, a, this is a way of making, making more precise sense of what this means. Okay? So, so, um, so, so this path integral gives you g-valued white noise, which is sort of, uh, this is what it is in probabilistic language. Okay? So it's a map. I'm on R2 right now, yes, it's because, because I, you need that for axial gauge. Okay. Okay. And you can actually uh, make sense of all the things I talked about before in terms of this probabilistic language. Okay. A Wilson loop is f of a holonomy. A holonomy is an ordinary differential equation. And if I replace that ordinary differential equation with the stochastic differential equation, stochastic because a is now a random variable. Okay. If I replace it with a, a stochastic differential equation in the sense of Stratonovich, because there's, there's, there's a theory for, you know, the, the theory for stochastic differential equations is, is rather subtle, and there's, uh, there's different notions of how to make sense of them, and this is the one due to Stratonovich. Um, I don't have time to really explain what I mean by that, but that's what this circle means, okay? So, so uh, and B means Brownian motion on the Lie algebra, so, so D of Brownian motion is sort of the distribution of, of A. Okay. Um, if I if I okay if I make sense of this differential equation, okay, in the sense that because you know a is random now, so it's a random differential equation, then what I find is that the holonomy is distributed as Brownian motion, okay, and Brownian motion is distributed as as the uh, heat kernel on G. Okay. So this is another way to see um, why this heat kernel business uh, sort of came up. This is sort of um, well, another way to see that in, in directly in the continuum theory. Okay. And sort of the mathematicians responsible for this point of view are uh, Driver and Gupta, who were students of Leonard Gross. Okay? And, um, and if you work in the continuum using this setup, you'll get the exact same answers as the, the lattice approach. Okay? Um, let me, um, so, yes, okay. So in terms of this question about whether Feynman diagrams give you the exact answer, I need to uh, tell you what the two-point function of this theory is, because that gives me Feynman diagrams. If you write a in terms of f, so you know you feed in integral along along a segment, a vertical segment, which is what I did here. I fed in a delta function at x zero, and then I feed in this you know indicator function along an interval. Then you can work out what the two-point function is. It's just it's just this thing. It's the two-point function is sort of a delta function uh, along the x-axis or the x zero direction, and then it's this this thing that you see from Brownian motion, the minimum of the, the two times, okay? Um, that's your two-point function, okay? And so, um, 
something I haven't completely written down yet, so that's why I'm just going to um, uh, be safe and call it in progress. Um, this next result is that the exact expectation will be the expectation in this axial gauge. Okay. So um, what I want to say, so so this is well, so th this actually this is in some sense this actually answers the fundamental question, although in an unsatisfactory way, in the sense that um, this is on R two where the theory is free. Um, so this is in some sense not so surprising. Uh, I really want to get to S two, which I'll get to in a minute. But this is sort of the this actually is sort of an answer to the fundamental question, okay? Because you have the exact side equaling the uh, perturbative side, although in axial gauge theory is free, so that's not. So surprising. Um, why, why haven't I written down everything yet? It's just because there's sort of a lot of probability theory going on. And, and, and one, of the, one of the main references is in French. And I, I need to somehow sit down and make sure I, I'm translating the French correctly. So I just haven't done that yet. But, um, but anyways, but you know, so what do you do? You write down a Wilson loop in terms of a path-ordered exponential. Uh, that path-ordered path exponential has to be reinterpreted st stochastically. And you're going to get these iterated Chertanovich intervals. And then you have to check that the expectation of that in the stochastic sense agrees with the Feynman diagrams using this rule. Okay. And um, so, so that's something to check. And you want to do it a little bit abstractly, because if your curves are extremely winding, you don't sort of want to do this brute force by hand. Okay, so what, what's the implementation of f of delta f0 and f1? Yeah, so f, remember, was a map from L2 functions to random variables. So I'm feeding in this sort of. Uh, it's not, it's not, this is not really an L2 function. This is sort of a, uh, but, but you know, you can reg, you know, you, the, I'm, I'm feeding it a function. Okay, so, so yeah, uh, we, we can talk about it more, but, but I'm, I'm feeding in this function. And, and uh, uh, a, a is a random variable, and it's obtained by this white noise mapping. And it was just the, the, the probabilistic version of this integration formula I wrote. Okay. So, uh, as for so this implies that the right-hand side, which is obtained by Feynman diagram, mm -hmm. is a convergence sum as a function yes. of the convergence. Yes, that's right. That's right. I see. Yeah. So, so the usual argument is that well, the number of Feynman diagrams grows like a factorial. Ah, but there's no interactions. So, so the, oh. all you have is the kinetic term, oh, and the only thing the only thing you're contracting is the expansion of the of the w, and that's an exponential which is already convergent. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there. There's basically, in some sense, only one Feynman diagram in every order. I see. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different contra I mean, there's lots of combinatorial things, but there's, yeah, you don't, yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. You don't have an e to something. Everything's out outside of the exponential. Yeah. OK. All right. OK. So, so actually, uh, in this direction, we have the exact result we want. OK, that's why. You know, so this is, I colored it in red, because you know, red, red's the color of desire, right? So this is good. All right, so, so, so for this stochastic axial gauge, we have agreement between the exact answer and perturbation theory. Although, in some, like I said, that's not really so surprising, because the theory is free on R2. Okay. Well, my, uh, as I'll explain, I really want to get to S2, because okay, you don't have this global axial gauge. Okay. And that's actually what this, this whole morphic gauge uh, is going to come in. This is, this is something that's actually quite, quite interesting. Okay. So, OK, so, so what's my next uh, result? So for holom there's, there's a, a different way to handle axial gauge using this Wu Mandelstam Librand uh, regularization. Okay. So let me uh, just, just, just to be sort of cano canonical or identical with the notation of the literature, let me go to these sort of uh, light cone coordinates. So I'm just going to rotate instead of x0, x1, I'm going to go to x0 plus x1, x0 minus x1. Okay. I can do axial gauge with respect to those variables. Okay, um, I said axial gauge was singular, and one way to see that is because you know this doesn't define a distribution. So I, I want to define uh, a propagator, which is an inverse of you know a derivative in a direction squared. So on the Fourier side, it looks like that. That doesn't define a distribution. Okay, so in two dimensions, one over k squared is not one. So you have to regularize it, and you could use if you use a suitable i epsilon prescription, then you will get a distribution. Okay. And sort of this might look funny if you haven't seen it before, but this is sort of the right i epsilon prescription that allows you to wick rotate, right? So for those of you who are familiar, right, if you use an i epsilon prescription where you sort of move down one pole and move up one pole, then you can, you know, rotate it. And so that's what sort of this is, this is doing. So okay. you're moving out of the Euclidean world and somehow moving into the Minkowski world here? Oh, no, no, everything's, I, I, I could have, 
you, you'll see in a moment why I did this, but the, 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 everything's Euclidean. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, right. I, I, all I did was just go from from these variables to these variables, and it doesn't matter what signature you're in. I, I just want to make this more, cons you know, more, more notationally uh, compatible with what you see in the literature. And, and there's a reason I did this too, because um, because of this common of Wick rotation, right? I can sort of, well, if I complexify my coordinates, okay, with this al alpha parameter, okay, uh, well. Well, when alpha is 0, I just got those coordinates. And when alpha is pi over 2, I get the usual complex coordinates, z and z bar. Okay. And um, if I sort of let you know, alpha, alpha goes to 0 was the, was the previous one you saw, if I kind of continue to alpha equals pi over 2, then I get z and z bar. So the reason I, I did x0 to x1 is just because then when, pi, when I get pi over 2, I get z and z bar. That's all. So that, it's just a parameterization. So, so anyways. Um, so this was, an ellip this, this was a, a nice uh, Green's function. And when I uh, c sort of complexify my coordinates and, and continue uh, alpha to pi over 2, I get this as my, um, my Green's operator. And it's the Green's operator for del bar squared. And that's easy to see, because one del bar kills the z bar. Another del bar gives you a delta function, because 1 over z is the Green's operator for one del bar. Okay. Um, I was a little bit imprecise there, but really you want to Think of the Green's function as having, uh, you know, one forms. So I want to write this in a more geometric way. This is the integral kernel for del bar star del bar, and this way of writing it, you see, um, what's nice about holomorphic gauge is that it extends to. See, I wrote it in a coordinate invariant way, so this manifestly extends. This expression extends to S two, right? S two doesn't have global holomorphic coordinates, but the decomposition into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic makes sense. Okay, and so does this operator. Okay. So, so I, I call this in my paper, you know, generalized axial gauge, right? So it's sort of you, you, you're, you're kind of killing off uh, uh, the anti-holomorphic direction, okay? Um, okay, but the, the advantage of this this formulation of axial gauge is that it generalizes to S two, okay? Right. So this and there there is some subtlety how to interpret this as a gauge. It's not really a gauge. A gauge means you have to use the unitary gauge group to go to your slice. Um, that's not really the case here. Okay, it's, it's really an analytic continuation in some sense of, of an honest gauge. Okay, and you can implement this on R two and S two. Okay, and for higher genus, you have some, you have holomorphic, you know, you have um, hol harmonic forms, and therefore, you know, holomorphic forms, and those zero modes are going to give you trouble. So uh, let's just restrict to S two. Okay, so zero modes are always problematic. You know, problematic. Um, so that's why I restrict to R two and S two. Okay, and well, in this gauge, quote unquote gauge. The theory becomes free because when I restrict to one zero forms, my uh, there's no bracket terms, and I get a del bar star del bar operator. And now my Feynman diagrams are now sum of iterated integrals of this propagator. Right? So remember, Feynman diagrams are obtained by inverting this guy. I told you that the inverse of this guy was this uh, was this nice uh, integral kernel I, I wrote earlier. Okay. And so now the problem becomes evaluating uh, these integrals. Okay. So when I write out the uh, a Wilson loop operator, right? I, ha I, I solve an ODE and I just, I just, uh, I pick a curve. I just, so to minimize notation, I just, you know, uh, abbreviate, you know, the connection evaluated along the curve uh, by this alpha, and I have this I sum of iterated integrals when I write out the holonomy as a path ordered exponential. Okay, and if f is a trace, I take the trace of all those, those integrals. When I take the expectation, I have to plug in the propagator, propagator into everything. And I'm suppressing a lot of notation here. For example, the propagator also has Lie algebra indices. And so there's also a sum over Lie algebra indices that I'm suppressing that, that are important. Okay? And, so, um, and so the problem becomes understanding right, whether the series I get here by computing these difficult integrals is that sort of the Taylor expansion of the expression I got from heat kernels. Okay, so these are two completely different mathematical objects. One is iterated integrals of this sort of, you know, Green's functions of complex operators. The other one was, uh, you know, matrix integrals over the over the gauge group. Okay. So uh, my next result, uh, my my most recent paper published uh, earlier this year, was to show that I got agreement up to two loops. Okay. So uh, the loop parameter is lambda. I couldn't go to three loops. So there's, you know, so that's the O of lambda three. So up to second loop, the the sum of those integrals. OK. Um, sorry, that should be, yeah, right. So this is a series in lambda. So what I'm saying is that to two loops, 
my, my series in lambda that I got from doing those iterated integrals of those, those Green's functions is given by this matrix integral. Okay? Um, this is an integral over the Lie algebra. Okay? Um, if you're a random matrix theorist, then this is the unitary group. This would be the Gaussian unitary ensemble. Okay? But this is a matrix algebra. Okay? So there's a Gaussian here. Um, it's weighted by the area of the, uh, the, the variance is proportional to lambda and the, the area of the, the curve. And I, you know, I integrate it against f of e to the x. That's the f appearing in there. Okay? And why is, how is this related to the fundamental question that I asked? Okay? Well, uh, so the curve lives on S2, but sort of the asymptotics of this is related to the exact answer in a funny way. I said that R2 was this decompactification of S2. So the right way to understand this right-hand side is I look at the asymptotics on S2, and then let S2 go to, go to R2. I, OK, that should be R2. Oh, yeah, the area go to infinity, so S2 goes to R2. And it turns out I get this as my asymptotics, exactly, to all orders. Okay? So th actually, this, this is actually a nice result. You see, this was, this was an integral over the, over the matrix group. This was an integral. If this were you know, G is, is UN, this is an integral over UN. Okay? And you have heat, two copies of the heat kernel. You study the asymptotics of the heat kernel. And there, there's a very nice formula for the heat kernel in terms of sums over GD6 that, that gets you a lot of mileage. Um, and uh, by exploiting that, you can actually rewrite the full asymptotics as this nice integral over here. Okay. And so anyway, so, so there's this right-hand side. This is the perturbative. And sort of this is the exact side, because it's, a, it's the asymptotics of the exact answer. Okay. So in terms of this nexus, uh, that's this orange result. Orange is not quite red. There's still more work to be done. Okay. So in, in this uh, holomorphic gauge, I, my result is, in up, is a two-loop result relating the perturbative expectation in holomorphic gauge to the exact asymptotics. Okay. And I guess the final or penultimate thing is uh, I recently was looking at this BV uh, setup again, and I believe I've been able to extend it to cover holomorphic gauge in the sense that I can prove that holomorphic gauge is equivalent to Coulomb gauge. Okay. So you pick a compatible metric, which so the metric has to be compatible with the area form, which is, um, is equivalent to using a conformal structure. And then I show that holomorphic gauge, you know, sum over Feynman diagrams and holomorphic gauge is sum over Feynman diagrams and Coulomb gauge. Okay? You can't do that explicitly. That's very hard to check. But what you do is you complexify the space of fields. And then, you do, you, you, you know, you, in terms of all these chain complexes, you deform this splitting, this Coulomb gauge splitting, into this, uh, well, so this is, the, this is the complexified gauge directions. Uh, C is complexification. Okay? So I complexify connections. I get a complexified gauge direction. And I either have the co complexified Coulomb or this holomorphic uh, gauge slice. And then by deforming one to the other, you can try to repeat this you know, chain homotopy business and then get that these two are equivalent. Okay, So then that's this equality here. Okay? And then uh, for, my, for my last part, just the, what's left. So the conjecture, the big conjecture that I'm trying to figure out is uh, for a general curve, okay. So, so my uh, this this only worked for simple uh, for s simple closed curves. It's a little unsatisfactory, but the the conjecture should be that for general curves, okay, they can intersect wildly, okay. On S two, is the asymptotics of the exact answer to all orders equal to holomorphic gauge, which is also Coulomb gauge, okay. And then letting S two to R two would yield the result on on R two. Okay, so that would recover this orange side. So, so what's left over? Okay, so I've mapped out some of these things. Sort of what would really make me happy and be a satisfactory answer to my fundamental question uh, would be to look at the exact asymptotics uh, of this thing and have it match to all orders with holomorphic gauge. So that's sort of what's what's sort of left on this nexus. Okay, great. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you.